Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's Proton webinar. I'm Zimo Yang, a second year graduate student in Professor Wei Xiong's group at UCSC, and I will be the host of today's talk. Before we start, I will make a few announcements about future schedule and the mechanisms of this webinar series. Okay, uh, first of all, the Journal of Chemical Physics will have this special issue of Proton chemistry, molecules in KFT and plasmonic media. The editor will be uh, Professor Jason, Shigai, Wei, and Hawaii, and you are all welcome to contribute. Uh, the submission deadline will be October 16th this year. Our webinar will be held every Wednesday uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and the registration for each webinar can be made through this link. Uh, here's the future schedule of our talks. One thing I would like to highlight is that we will also extend our webinar invitations to postdocs as our panelists. And the first group of postdocs invited are Dr. Christine Anadotter from University of St. Andrews and Dr. Bing Gu from UC Irvine on July 15th. Another thing I would like to mention is that we recently created this Proton Chemistry Online Community webpage on Facebook which allows everyone to share papers and post announcements. You can search by its name. Meanwhile, we have uploaded our recorded videos on this Proton Chemistry Webinar YouTube channels. For those who missed the talk, you can subscribe and watch these videos later. Finally, I would like to introduce the mechanisms of this webinar. During the talk, attendees are all muted. For those who have questions, you can click this uh, raise hand button and I will interrupt the speaker at an appropriate time to enable your audio to ask questions. Also, you can type in your comments or ideas using chat function so that you can share with everyone. For Q&A, you can type your uh, questions there, uh, which will be addressed at the end of the talk. So for the questions that are not answered due to the limit time, we will click and send to speaker after the talk. Now let's move back to today's webinar. Today's speaker is Professor Jackson Block from Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnologies. Professor Block got her bachelor degree in the City of Paris Industrial pa uh, Physics and uh, Chemistry Higher Educational Institution in the first place. She then received a master and PhD degree in the Paris Six University. Now, Professor Block is a specialist of quantum and nonlinear optics in senior conductor and heterostructures. The research life she has followed along her career is devoted to the ultimate confinement of both light and charges in other structures and to the study of light matter interaction and optical nonlinearities. Her group is one of the leaders in the exploration of quantum fluids of light. She has demonstrated the interest of protonics for the development of um, optical devices such as proton lasers, dyes, optical par parametric oscillators, and bistable devices. Uh, she has mastered uh, the development of proton lattice, allowing implementing complex Hamiltonians and exploring a variety of different physical situations like nonlinear Josephson physics, uh, nonlinear tunneling, quasi crystal properties, graphene physics, topological lattice, or even Hawking physics in black hole analogies thanks to the recent progress of her group. Semiconductor microcavities now emerge as a promising platform to explore quantum simulations with quantum fluids of light. Today, she will give a talk entitled as Excitonic Plurotons in Semiconductor Lattice. Now let's welcome Professor Jacqueline Block. Uh, Professor, you may share your screen now. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. I hope. Uh, this is going to be okay. Okay, so thank you very much for this nice introduction. And I would like to, to say hello to everybody who is uh, now connected. So what I would like to do today is to really to, to give you an, uh, an overview and some insight into the physics we are developing in my group in the Center for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology and why it's interesting to uh, explore polariton physics uh, in uh, lattices. So since uh, the audience is quite educated in uh, polariton physics, 
I'm not going to, uh, to describe, I'm going to introduce very quickly uh, the, the system. Uh, so I will make a very brief introduction to Polariton on their own. And then I will give some more information about the way we can design Polariton lattices and why this is interesting, what kind of physics we can address and so give a, a more general context to this physics uh, of uh, lattices in photonic systems. And so then I have chosen two very recent work that we did uh, in the group, uh, which uh, illustrate some aspects of the physics that can be done uh, with this polaritonic platform. So the first example uh, will be the, the study of localization of polaritons or, of wa or waves uh, in systems which are called Kazi crystals. So we will see that there are different Kazi crystals, that there is actually a phase diagram that we can draw and that we can explore with polaritons. And in particular, we can monitor the emergence of criticality uh, in Kazi crystals. So then the second example I have chosen is more related to how we can think about application with polariton lattices. And I will show you, uh, present to you a, a laser that, that we have demonstrated, uh, which is based on a ring of uh, coupled resonator and which allows to uh, obtain lasing uh, in a mode which presents an orbital angular momentum. And this orbital angular momentum can be optically controlled. So then I will briefly uh, give an overview of some different examples, so showing some more aspects of the physics of cavity polariton in lattices, and then I will uh, describe some perspectives that I think are very interesting for the field. So first I'm going to remind you what polaritons are. So they are quasi-particles emerging from the strong coupling regime between photons which are confined within the cavity. So here we have two mirrors and this cavity. Uh, and excitons which are confined in quantum wells that we can insert at the antinode of the electromagnetic field of the cavity mode. So you can see that as a, an, a constant oscillation between photons oscillating back and forth within the cavity, being absorbed to create an exciton, then re-emitted again, uh, again being ba balancing back and forth within the cavity and be reabsorbed again. So at the end of the day, the eigenstates of the system are mixed exciton photon states, which have this very particular uh, dispersion. So you have in particular the lower branch, which has a very steep dispersion so that the polaritons have a very low, uh, small effective mass. And you see this very peculiar S shape of the lower polariton. So these polaritons are interesting because they are mixed light matter particle, particle and they have properties coming from both parts. So from the photon part, these polaritons have a very low effective mass and because of that they can be confined in microstructures or so in typical resonator of a few micron uh, scale. They can be very significantly confined and this is how we are going to build uh, lattices. And then we will see that we can also monitor photon coming out from the cavity. And this will allow a unique opportunity to really directly see the modes of the structure in reciprocal space, in real space. And this is something that we can do with a lot of precision. And you will see that, for example, for the Kazi crystal, this is very important. Then this polariton, they have an excitonic component. And so this excitonic component gives to the system very strong nonlinearity, so like a care nonlinearity. You can also use this quantum well as a gain medium, and so you can promote lasing in some particular mode that you will engineer. Also very interesting is the fact that these polaritons, thanks to their excitonic part, are sensitive to magnetic field. So if you apply a magnetic field to an exciton, it will, the exciton level will split and you will have two uh, non-degenerate Zeeman splitting, uh, splitted modes. And so uh, because, because of that, polaritons also acquire a Zeeman splitting under a magnetic field, which means that you have photons confined in a cavity with a huge nonlinearity and a very strong also response to a magnetic field. 
So as I told you, we are going to probe polaritons coming out from the sample. And as probably most of you know, if you look at the emission from your top coming out of, so photons coming out from your cavity as a function of energy and angle, actually you can map the angle to the in-plane wave vector of your polariton states. And you can thus fully reconstruct the polariton band structure, which is a very important tool. You can also look at photons coming out from different places. So look at the emission as a function of real space. And here, for example, I show you a top view, uh, an image of a honeycomb lattice uh, made of polariton resonators, which is lasing. And you can clearly see the different uh, micropillars, the different individual sites which are emitting light. Using interferometry, you can also retrieve the phase of the polariton field. You can image vortices, solitons. You can finally measure the, the spatial and the temporal first order coherence, uh, correlation, so the coherence of the, the system. And also you can measure the emission statistics, so get access to the second order uh, correlation function. So what I want to say is that using very standard optical spectroscopy tool, you can really monitor your polariton field within the cavity. So now, how do we engineer uh, lattices? So actually, the first method that we use is really like in a textbook uh, of solid state physics uh, using the, the method which is called tight bending. So as in a solid, you would take the orbital of a single atom and then bring a second atom close by and couple the orbital and then bit by bit you would construct the whole crystal and form, form band. The same way you can take a single micropillar resonator. So you consider here such a micropillar. You imagine that you have the two mirrors, the cavity, and then there is a lateral confinement of the waves because of the index of refraction contrast between the semiconductor and air. So if you look at photons coming out from such a micropillar from the top, uh, you can see here uh, the emission as a function of energy and position. And you see here two discrete modes, the lowest energy one having an antinode at the center. So it's called, it's, we call it an S mode. It looks like the S orbital of an individual atom. And then the second mode has a, non, uh, a zero at the center and two lobes, which you can show that they are out of phase. And this looks like a P orbital. So it's twice degenerate and you have PX and PY orbitals. So then if you fabricate two of these micropillar and they are very close to each other and can be coupled, then you see that the mod hybridize and you form an anti-bonding, a bonding and anti-bonding mod, uh, mods for the S orbitals and the same for the P orbitals. So really like in, a photo, in an atomic, a diatomic molecule. And then uh, if you fabricate if you fabricate an array of these coupled lattices, then you see the formation of collective modes, which are fully delocalized in real space. And if you look at their emission as a function of angle, you engineer a band structure uh, because of the coupling of all these individual micropillars. So there are many different technological approach to fabricate lattices that you can find is this very nice review from Christian Schneider. So uh, this type bending approach, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my mouse. Uh, this type bending approach is very, very uh, fruitful and very successful. And for example, I can show you here this 1D lattice, which has three atoms per unit cell and which has the peculiarity that the middle branch is a flat band. It, has, it is non-dispersive and it is due to the uh, phase frustration within the individual lattice site. And so what you here you see the picture of this lattice that was etched from the planar cavity and you can see the, 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 the coupled uh, micropillar designing this uh, 1D lip lattice. And so what you see here is the, the, the measurement of the dispersion of this lattice in uh, K-space and, and you see clearly that there is a band which is non-dispersive so we see indeed this flat band. And now if you look in real space at the emission exactly at the energy of this flat band, you see this pattern. And so you see that indeed in the flat band, the middle pillar, the one where there is this phase frustration is dark and which is really the, the signature of the fact that we have indeed this frustrated lattice. 
So you see that uh, we have here a unique tool to really monitor the bands in real and the reciprocal space. Another very nice example is the honeycomb lattice of micropillar, which mimic the physics of graphene. And so here, if you look just at the lowest part of this dispersion that you can measure in such a lattice, you see directly the very characteristic band structure of graphene with diracons. And if you look at the emission at exactly this energy, you can retrieve as a function of kx and ky, you see directly the six Dirac points, the first Brillouin zone, and so on. So we have really an emulator of the physics of uh, a graphene layer. We have actually more than that because you see that we have also these bands which emerge from the hybridization of the p orbitals, where there is also a, a lot of very interesting physics to develop. We have a flat band here. We have new Dirac cones. So we did actually a lot of things studying this uh, physics uh, in polariton honeycomb. Uh, uh, excuse me, Professor. Uh, yes. We have we have a question here. I will okay. uh, enable the. Um, hi there. Um, I have a question hi. about the uh, the flat band that you described. Um, that one is degenerate with the uh, the many exciton states at very large k's. So do you not see, say, uh, that there is like hybridization with this like continuum of uh, dark k modes? I mean, this this flat band does have photon component, right? Yes. And here, the, the exciton states are at higher energy. We are at negative detuning. So actually, the photon, the cavity mode is uh, split into these various uh, uh, bands. But the exciton is still at higher energy. So oh, it's, it's higher energy than zero. Yes. So, so, so there we are, are, okay. what we call a negative detuning. So the, photonic fra the excitonic fraction is quite small here. OK, thank you very much. OK. Does it answer to your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, cool. OK, so uh, it's the same here. The, the exciton is here. So there is some excitonic component here, but it's very small. So we, are, we don't have a problem with the excitonic reservoir. OK, so another approach, which is also described in textbooks of solid state physics, is um, uh, another way to build the bands in a crystal. You consider free electrons and you perturb them with the potential induced by the, the ions of the crystal. So we can do the same. We can engineer, for example, 1D structure and then introduce a slight modulation of the, the section of these wires so that it creates a modulation, a potential, which can be treated as a perturbation. So if you make just a regular wire like this one, what you see is that actually you are going to quantize the lateral component of your wave vector and form different subbands that you can actually see when you look at the emission as a function of Ky, Ky being along this uh, free propagation direction. And then I can show you here a wire which is periodically modulated. So you see that you have some regions which are smaller so the energy increases, the confinement energy is larger, and you have regions which are uh, wider so that the confinement energy is smaller. So at the end, you have free propagating polaritons perturbed by a periodic potential, which you can control the, the height by changing this modulation, and you can control also the periodicity. And so what you expect is that you are going to form, to, to create new Brillouin zones and form mini bands with mini gaps. And this is exactly what you see. So we will use that for the Kazi crystal. I will come back to that later. So once we have this way of engineering lattices, we can think about uh, exploring the physics of arrays of coupled cavities. And so this is a subject that has been addressed by many theoreticians. So for example, you can coherently drive such an array you have on-site interaction because of our care nonlinearity. You have hoping from one cavity to the other. We saw that there is a coupling. There is loss because the reflectivity is not perfect of the mirror and photon eventually escape. So we have really a driven dissipative system. And so depending on the, the parameters of the system, we will be able to explore a, a large variety of uh, problems and explore new phases for your photon field. 
And so this is a, a field which is developing very rapidly these days. There are other platforms than the Polariton ones which are developed, for example, coupled waveguides, coupled ring resonators, photonic crystal. And what we think is that our platform is really interesting because of its very strong nonlinearity, which is more difficult to obtain in, in other systems. So uh, now I'm going to go to more details. So I don't know if you have more questions and then I will go into the detail of more recent uh, topics. I don't know if there is a question, otherwise I will continue. Yeah, okay? I think you can con continue now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about quasi crystal and more generally, this is related to the field of uh, the study of localization of waves in materials. And this comes uh, already, uh, I mean, uh, back to the, the, the years of uh, Anderson, who discovered, for example, the Anderson localization, which is responsible for the fact that some materials are insulating because electrons cannot propagate because of the disorder. Uh, so there are some materials which are very fascinating, which are called quasi-crystals, which are really between ordered periodic systems and fully disordered ones. So these are systems which have no periodicity, but still have some long range order. And so they were discovered uh, in the 80s and there was actually a Nobel Prize uh, awarded to this field. And so um, there are many synthetic um, uh, quasi crystal which have been fabricated uh, either in the microwave domain or in photonic systems, uh, in exploring different properties of this material, this uh, quasi crystal. Also, they have been implemented for phonons or also in cold atom systems. So, what I would like to describe is uh, two different quasi crystals which are very famous and have been explored by many people. The first one is called Aubrey Andre Harper. And so the, the way you fabricate this quasi crystal is by considering a periodic chain of uh, atoms or sites, which are coupled so to, with each other by with the coupling T. And what you do, so there is a, a periodicity of your lattice. And what you do is you consider a potential which you are going to apply to your system, so to superimpose to your chain. And this potential has a period which is incommensurate with the periodicity of the lattice. And so because of this incommensurability, uh, the system is a quasi crystal. And so depending on the heights and the amplitude of this uh, potential, so the amplitude is called lambda, uh, what matters is the relative amplitude between lambda and the, the coupling constant T. So depending on this value uh, of lambda over T, localization properties of waves inside this quasi crystal are completely different. When lambda over two is smaller than two, all the states are extended. And so the system is metallic, it can transport currents. Whereas when lambda is larger than two T, all the states are localized and the system is fully insulating. And in between for lambda over T divide equal to two, the system is really in between the two and it is actually critical. So the spectrum, the energy spectrum is fractal and the localization of the states decays with the power law and is so-called uh, critical. There is another quasi crystal, which is also very famous, which is called Fibonacci. So here we are going to consider a, a tight bending model and we are going to apply a potential on each side this time the potential will take only two values. So for example, minus lambda and lambda, and the, the succession of lambda and minus lambda values will follow a Fibonacci sequence. So you have also an amplitude of this potential, and then you can calculate. So there are several ways to generate this Fibonacci sequence. One is given by this, Vn is proportional to lambda, and then you have a formula which gives you uh, the, the whether it's, it's going to be plus lambda or minus lambda. And V is an irrational number, like for example, the golden mean. So what is very interesting with this quasi crystal is that whatever the value of lambda, all the states are always critically localized. 
And so what it means, so here I show you an example of such a state. So it is not fully delocalized and neither fully localized. And there is some fractality. So you see that you have some pattern that you see. And now if you zoom further into the state with a smaller scale, you will again find this pattern and so on. So there is some fractality and actually the energy spectrum is fractal. So then there was a very interesting proposal a mathematical proposal done by Krauss and Zilberberg in 2012, which says that actually you can find a formula, a magic formula, which depends on lambda and on a new parameter, which is called beta, which, is actually, which allows you actually to continuously deform the, the quasi-crystal, the Aubry-Andrean quasi-crystal into the Fibonacci. So when beta equals zero, you see this uh, black potential. This is the Aubry Andre one. And then as beta goes, uh, grows and goes to infinity, you see that the potential becomes steeper and steeper. And for beta equal infinity, you have only two values and you recover the Fibonacci potential. So it means that you can draw a phase diagram like this, where lambda is the height of the potential, lambda over t. Beta is this parameter. For beta equals zero, we are in the Aubry Andre regime, and we know that for lambda, small values of lambda, we have extended states. For large value of lambda, we have localized states. And for beta equal infinity, we have critical states. So the question that we ask to ourselves with our theoretical friends from ETH and the group of Odette Zilberberg is how do the, 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 do the states evolve? from extended to critical, from localized to critical. So how do these localization properties evolve to continuously go from this quasi crystal to the other one? So to study this localization property, you can define a quantity which is called the inverse participation ratio, IPR, which uh, is going to uh, uh, describe the localization properties of your state. So if you have extended states, this IPR is going to be equal to one over N, N being the number of atoms you have on your chain. So it, grows to, it goes to zero if you have an infinite chain. Whereas if you have localized uh, states, the IPR will be close to one. So uh, you can, uh, so what we did with our colleague is calculate within a tight banding approach, what is the value of the IPR when you change lambda and when you change beta. So uh, here you are in the aubrey andre case, here, here you are going closer to the Fibonacci. And so to understand the color, this is the IPR. When it is close to one, you have localized states. So red is localized and blue is more and more extended. And so what you see is that what we discover here is that for, uh, if we start with the localized, from the localized part of the aubry andre model, you start localized, very red, and you go progressively, you increase beta. What we discover is that it does not uh, change continuously. There are some lobes you see here, which are blue, which means that the states suddenly delocalize and then relocalize again and then delocalize and relocalize again. So there is like a cascade of delocalization transition. And this is the way the states evolve from localized to critical. And if you look at the IPR, you see that each time you cross such a, a lobe, the IPR decreases. And here the states are localized on one letter, then above the first lobe, they are localized on two letters, then on four letters, and so on. And so progressively, the side, the, some side peaks develop, and this is how the states become more and more critical and fractality develops. So this was something completely new that we wanted to explore also experimentally. So to do that, we did some modulated wire, so using this perturbation approach, and you see here uh, wires where the modulation, so this is the top view of this wire. This is the potential that it implements. And this is the aubry andre potential. And then you see different wires for increasing values of beta. And here this is the Fibonacci potential. So you see they look quite similar, 
But actually, these very small changes, changes in this, the shape of this wire is going to dramatically change the properties of localization of your polarities. So here I want to show you a first uh, uh, an example of a wire which is in the Aubry André uh, case for a, a large value of lambda. So this is the localized phase of the Aubry André. And I want to show you, so here you see what we measure as a function of position along the wire and energy. And here I show you so that you can understand how it works, the potential that is implemented on the wire. And what I want to show you is that we have a very precise control of these wires. You see that in the potential, for example, there are regions where you have a minimum, which is on a single letter. And indeed, you see that in the polariton states, we have a, state, a, a mode which is localized at low energy on a single letter. In other regions, you have a potential dip, which is more localized on two letters. And you see that here, indeed, we have a state which is on two letters, which looks like the bonding mode of the two letters. And on top, you have the anti-bonding mode of the two letters. You see that here also. And again, you have it here. So this is to show you that the control that we have and that indeed, by shaping these wires, we are really able to implement some quasi-crystal in a controlled way. So now let's see how this, so we are here in the phase diagram, and now I'm going to show you uh, different points when going up in beta. So here you see, for example, two points which are uh, here, which are close to the transition. And you see that all, the, all these points which were scattered, they come very close to each other and they hybridize and form really something which looks very flat. And then when you go above these values of beta, you again recovered very scattered localized spots. And what is really interesting is that actually, when you are here and you zoom, you really see a band structure appearing in K-space, which means that you have really extended states. So this is a demonstration of this first lobe. We go from very localized states to more extended one for this value, and then again, very um, extended uh, localized states. And so by looking at many of these wires, we could actually retrieve a part of this phase diagram and really see this first lob of um, delocalization transition. If we look in more detail, you see that actually below the lob of localization, indeed the lowest energy states are localized on one letter. And then when you go across the first lob, the two modes are lo the lowest energy mode are localized on two letters. And this is actually this first plateau that we see. So the second plateau in the IPR showing that we are localized on two letters. So of course it would be nice to explore more lobes, but uh, it was uh, not possible at the time because we had to move our lab and this is going to be the, maybe the subject of further work. So okay. I want to... Okay. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we have a pro uh, we have a question here uh, from Paul. Okay. Hi. Sorry, this is uh, Paul Yun from UCSD again. So uh, I have a question. So all of these things that you have described uh, don't assume that you have any say random uh, potential perturbations like disorder. So uh, I imagine that these uh, localization to the localization and back to localization transitions still happen with. Uh, if you have imperfect uh, preparation of your samples? Yes, so you see there is still some disorder. So there, there is, so we have a, a deep, so we can look also along the wires to see uh, that, uh, to see a region where it seems that there is a bit less of disorder. And if you zoom there on this part, you would see that in the simulation, we expect something very flat and then there is some fluctuation. So if you look at our paper mm -hmm. in the supplemental, we provide the simulation of exactly the same kind of potential and the simulated pattern that we should see. So it's mm -hmm. not bad. There is some disorder, but uh, we still see uh, very well. The, I mean, it, it, we have some control. But, but of course, is it possible that for certain amounts of disorder, these the passage through those delocalized states does not happen? Yes, yes. Then you could broaden so much this uh, band that you would not see it anymore. Yes. 
of course. Okay. Uh, can, can you explain how big are these, like what you call letters or uh, maybe like, like each of these, uh, say, pattern feature? What, what is the length scale of these things? Uh, so letters. typically you see this is five micron. I okay. think it's, it's uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the precise number. Yeah, I think it's of the order of two micron or something like this. But th so this is a m much. This is on the order of the wavelength, or less than that. Oh, it's much less. I mean, the, okay, the okay. Uh, you see, it's, we are around eight fifty. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the wavelength inside the material is much much smaller. But the polaritons, though, know, they are big objects. So mm -hmm. actually, because of their very light effective mass, mm -hmm. a polariton is something that is of the order of. Uh, like uh, two, three, four micron uh, widths, the area, the correspondence area. And so they are able to really see, to probe uh, a large region of this uh, uh, potential and so to, to be sensitive to the periodicity. Wait, so, but then, you, but then I, I do have a question. So then uh, in terms of the coherence length of the light, so uh, how big is the, what, what is the maximum length scale that, that we should be considering, say, across I, th that uh, I mean, I think it can be like uh, of the order of uh, 50 micron that you 50 can microns. see. Depends on the Q factor, but the light is, uh, the, mod, the Q factor is very big. It's of the order of uh, 30,000 or 70,000, so that uh -huh. the wave is very extended. And so they are able to feel that. Polariton will never confine within such a small trap. Sure, they sure. will really average the potential. But, but what, is, what, what is the finite size effect on all these look The, the wires, they are, uh, uh, we don't see finite size. So typically the width, the, the size of the wires is, is of the order of 200 micron. And uh, yeah. polariton, so the, the, they don't probe the, um, the edge. We are, feel that they are in an infinite wires. You see what I mean? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Okay, we have another question from... Okay, cool. Okay, you may talk now. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hi, so I, I was just wondering, for each of these lobes is a localized piece, is that correct? Yes. I see, so, so and the idea is that as you increase beta, then at beta infinity, you get the critical phase. Yes. I see. And, and so, so in between, as you transition from one lobe to the other, uh, you said this is, this is itself a critical point? This is? A critical no. point? Was, it's not uh, a critical This point. was here, exactly yeah. here, that there is a critical point. But as a function here. of beta, if you, fix, if you fix lambda and you increase beta and you go from one lobe to the next, is that a critical point? Or? No, it's not. It's a region where you are extended. I it's see. not, it's really like playing waves and you see a band. I see, I so see. So extended states. Got it, okay, thank you. Because far, uh, far above, okay? Got it, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, you, may, you may continue, Professor. I may continue. So mm -hmm. I'm going to move to the second example, uh, which is the, um, so I mean, the, the things that I've showed you are very fundamental. So these are really fundamental properties of quasi crystal. It may be interesting also then, then to include non-interaction, -interac so non-linearities. This is something that we are presently doing. Now I want really to discuss an something which is more related to application. To, to, and I would like to highlight that Polariton Lattice also allow to design new concepts for, for lasers, which may find very interesting application in photonics. And so the example I want to describe here is a system where we have six coupled micropillar. So it emulates the physics of a benzene and molecule. You imagine that you have your six coupled carbon atoms. And so you can describe this system with a very simple tight bending Hamiltonian, where you consider that all the sites are at zero energy and you just have a coupling between each uh, site and its nearest neighbor. So when you compute that, what you find is that you have actually four energy levels and all the states are uh, collective eigenstates, which are delocalized over the six elementary orbitals. And they are a linear superposition of these six orbitals with a complex coefficient, which is labeled by L. 
So the lowest en energy states correspond to L equals zero, and all the, the elementary orbitals are in phase. The upper state, it corresponds to L equals three, and then uh, every state, every site is out of phase with its neighbor. And then there are two states which are very interesting in between, which are, so two levels which are twice degenerate, and which corresponds first here to L equal plus one or minus one, and here to L equal plus two and minus two. And actually, this corresponds to modes which carry an orbital angular momentum, L equal plus or minus h bar, or L equal plus or minus two h bar. And it means that the phase is wandering or when you go across the, the, the molecule, you get a phase accumulation of plus or minus two pi or plus or minus four pi. So uh, actually, so when you, you look at the spectroscopy, so you excite such a molecule and you look at its photoluminescence, you indeed see these four levels. So actually to make a complete description of this molecule, you need also to take into account the polarization of light. And actually, if you compute Maxwell equation and you look at the modes in such a structure, uh, you can find that actually uh, the modes which have a polarization which is parallel to the bonding are not, do not exactly couple to each other with the same strengths as, as the mode which have a polarization orthogonal to the bonding. So it means that the splitting between bonding and anti-bonding mode will not be exactly the same for H and V polarization. So it means that if we want to take into, to compute all the modes in such a molecule, we don't have six modes, but we have 12 modes now that we want to take into account the polarization. And then we have to write a tight bending Hamiltonian where we take into account the fact that the coupling on this, for example, in this bond is not exactly the same for the blue and for the right polarization. So you see that we couple the polarization degree of freedom, which is the spin degree of freedom, if we consider that light has a pseudo spin, which can be plus one for sigma plus and minus one for sigma minus polarization. So there is a coupling between the spin of the mode and the azimutal angle, which means the orbital degree of freedom. So if you compute this Hamiltonian, you find actually that these two levels, which are so interesting, they acquire a fine structure. And you see that they split into three levels. Uh, the lowest one corresponds to a linear superposition of L equal minus one sigma plus and L equal plus one sigma minus. So you see that the degrees of freedom of spin and orbital, they are now entangled. And this mode actually corresponds to a linearly polarized mode with a polarization which is azimutal. The upper one is also an entangled state, but with a different linear combination. And there the mode is uh, radially linearly polarized. And then the two modes in the center, they are super interesting because they are pure of orbital angular momentum and pure of polarization. So the question is, can we uh, spontaneously see emission from one of these two modes or here in the other manifold for one of these two modes which carry a net orbital angular momentum? So of course, if there is no breaking of time reversal symmetry, there is no reason why you would favor one or the other. So somehow you have to break time reversal symmetry. And what is nice is that you can break time reversal symmetry by pumping the system with a linear polarization. So imposing a sigma plus polarization. So what we are going to do is to pump non-resonantly. So we create high energy electron hole pair, which are spin polarized. They will relax emitting phonons they will lose part of their spin polarization, but you will see that we will still have some remaining uh, circular polarization of the gain medium. And then when you reach transparency, there will be mod competition between the different modes. And you will see that, so the modes which will couple to a sigma plus polarized gain will be these three modes because they have a sigma plus component. But you see that because of this one over square root of two, these two modes will have a, a coupling which is twice smaller than this one. So this one will win the gain. And it's the same if you tune the gain to the, the, the other manifold, you have a chance to see lasing 
in this mode, which is sigma plus, and then you will see L equal minus two. So this is what we want to do. So break time reversal symmetry with the polarization of the pump. So here I show you some spectra recorded um, looking at the emission, the total emission from the, such a molecule. We pump it sigma plus, and you see that below threshold, we have a very small circular polarization, typically 10, 15%, but still there is a bit more luminescence in sigma plus than in sigma minus polarization. And then when you reach threshold, so you increase the power, you see that sigma plus is overcoming uh, sigma minus and eventually above threshold, we have really a lazy mode, which is essentially sigma plus. And you see, if we look where the light comes from, it comes really from the whole molecule, so it looks like a collective mode, and there is almost nothing in sigma minus. So, indeed, we are able to laze under sigma plus, under non-resonant sigma plus pumping. So now I need to show you that this mode carries an orbital angular momentum. So to do that, we need to measure the phase of the different lobes and see some, uh, if there is an orbital momentum. So to do that, uh, we are going to do interferometry. So we will send the, the, the emission into a Max Zender interferometer, and in one of the arms, we are going to enlarge the image a lot so that when we recombine the two arms, we will interfere the entire molecule with the enlarged image of just one pillar. So one pillar is going to serve as a reference. Of course, we cannot do interferometry between this lasing emission and the, the excitation laser because they are not at all at the same energy. So this is why we are going to use part of the emission as a phase reference. And we will measure the phase difference between each lob and the one that we have chosen as a reference. So this is the phase pattern we observe. Directly, these are raw data that we see directly on the CCD camera when pumping sigma plus. And we can, by, inter by Fourier transforming this uh, image, uh, recover the phase and access the, the phase of the different logs. And you see that the phase is indeed rotating and uh, uh, we get an accumulation of two pi when we make a two pi rotation. Now, if we pump sigma minus, you see that this pitchfork dislocation is on the other side, and you see that the phase is rotating in the other way. So we have here an orbital angular momentum of plus one or plus h bar, and here minus one, and we can control this uh, elicity just by the, pump, the, the polarization of, the, laser, of the, the excitation beam. Now I show you another molecule where the gain is larger for the L equal to manifold, and here you see under sigma plus pumping, you have now two pitch for dislocation, and you see that the phase is rotating by four pi. So we have an L equal plus two uh, lasing mode. And of course, we can change the polarization and observe uh, L equal minus two. So, me, Professor, interesting uh, to generate a question. Yes. Uh, how are oh. you? Hello, I, I found uh, this idea of symmetry breaking uh, using this uh, circularly polarized pump set very intriguing. So I, I, I want to understand it based on what I understand about uh, molecules and the polarization of emission of molecules. So here you have the competition of uh, the pump power and uh, the boson scattering, which is helping you uh, see, uh, populate these, these modes. So my question is, uh, do you have an understanding of what is the time scale of the polarization of these uh, cir circularly polarized states and how does that compare to the threshold for the lazy? Uh, so, um, I think, uh, so probably, so in this, uh, so typically the, the relaxation time uh, to populate, so the, the rise time of the, if you were to measure the time result in a time result way, uh, the emission, what you would see is that the rise time uh, of uh, the luminescence is typically uh, a few picoseconds. So the, it means that the relaxation is faster than a few picoseconds, especially when you are close to threshold, I would say that if it's of the order of a few picoseconds. So it means that the depolarization is uh, of the order probably of a few 10 picoseconds. 
So, uh, so actually what uh, some colleagues uh, told us is that if we were to pump the system with a pulse and we, were get, we would get a, a pulse laser, uh, probably the, the game medium would not have time to depolarize completely and we would get a much higher polarization ratio. So I think it's of the order of 10 to a few 10 picoseconds, the polarization uh, the depolarization. But, but okay. th that would be the depolarization on 50% X and 50% Y, right? Like basically you would destroy the circular yeah. polarization, right? Or random uh, statistical mixture. All right. Thank you. That's a very beautiful experiment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so actually, uh, I don't know if I'm, uh, yes. So just uh, before that, uh, going further, I want to say that this orbital angular momentum a source of light are very interesting, very relevant for different kinds of application. So for example, orbital angular momentum has been proposed to uh, actually um, uh, encode information, either classical or quantum information, because you can actually fabricate large value of the orbital angular momentum. So it's really a degrees of freedom, which theoretically is unbounded. Uh, you can also use it, use it in nano manipulation. So, for example, if you use in biology uh, optical tweezer, you can actually transfer this orbital orbit, uh, angular momentum of light into a mechanical angular moment, uh, 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 momentum and actually have your nanoparticle rotate on themselves. So, you can really transfer this uh, angular momentum to nanoparticle. And so there are several approaches these days to, to try to develop these kind of uh, structures. And typically, there are two approaches. One which is very versatile, which is based on, based on special light modulators. So for example, with uh, liquid crystals. Uh, but these devices are very bulky and usually very slow. So it's very difficult to scale uh, the system, but it's very versatile. You can really imprint whatever phase pattern you want on the devices. Uh, the other approach is uh, really to try to integrate the system and so uh, to fabricate an integrated source of orbital angular momentum light. Uh, and they are usually based on metamaterials or resonator where you actually break the, the, the helicity, so you break uh, the time reversal symmetry by imprinting some helicity on your, uh, on your resonator. So you actually make a difference between L equal plus one and minus one just by the shape of your resonator. So this, of course, limits the versatility because once you have your resonator, you have it and you cannot change the, 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 the shape of it. So what we have here is actually a system where we can optically control the elasticity and it's very scalable. So this is a good point. The operation temperature of our system was possible up to 80K. Above 80K, typically at 100K, uh, actually we, we lost the spin polarization. And this is why probably going to pulse excitation could improve the, the performance of the device. Uh, but I, actually it, the, the concept is really a general. And so if you could put different active material inside such a cavity or an open cavity with six sides, you could actually uh, really operate this kind of system at, at room temperature, what you need is to have some spin polarization. Uh, even using magnetic uh, uh, um, gates, you could inject an, uh, an uh, spin polarized current and have this system operate uh, under electrical in, uh, injection. So this is to show you that polariton lattices are interesting for devices. Uh, so I've discussed uh, today this orbital angular momentum laser. It's also possible to implement lattices which have topological properties and to trigger lasing on uh, topologically protected edge states. So we have done that on the 1D lattice. And uh, then there is also the work of the group of uh, Würzburg, of uh, Sven Oefling, where they could actually observe lasing on uh, topological edge states in a 2D lattice. And so this is super interesting because this much should propagate without any scattering uh, by defect. So this is very interesting for application. So just to say that all the people who are working on new materials which can work at room temperature could potentially implement these uh, ideas at room temperature. So I'm going to 
go a bit faster. I just want to say that I, I know that all those things that I've showed to you today were actually making use of actually the engineering of the photon part of polariton and not so much of the excitonic part. The excitonic part was used as somehow a source of light to illuminate from the inside the modes in the quasi crystal was used as a gain medium for the orbital angular momentum, but it's also possible to really look at the kern nonlinearity in the structure, so I don't have much time to, to describe that, but I want to say that we have recently, and if you're interested, you can look at this paper, looked at the kern nonlinearity and the nonlinear response of the flat band in such a 1D lattice, and we have seen actually the formation of nonlinear domains which are really quantized, so they are occupy really a finite number of unit cells and they don't expand. And this is really due to the fact that we are in a flat band and that there is no kinetic energy. So polaritons are locked into this nonlinear domain and cannot propagate. So this is using the nonlinearity to start to look at nonlinear behavior in complex lattices. So uh, also, uh, so, as I told you, uh, there are a lot of applications which can be foreseen and I think it's really very encouraging to see all the developments that have been done, uh, looking for example at uh, large band gap material like zinc oxide, 2D materials, perovskites, which can potentially really operate at room temperature. Uh, there are a lot of things to do related to topology and for example in a recent work we have been able to really retrieve uh, topological invariant in graphene, just uh, doing luminescence on polaritons and using the ability to, to measure k-space, project uh, different states in k-space with a cylindrical lens and like, then look at real space. So really using this uh, unique opportunity to image k-space and real space, we could retrieve topological invariant. And there is a very interesting topic which is related to nonlinearity. What is the response of the system? Is it influenced by the topology when you are in a topological lattice? What is the interplay between topology and nonlinearity? And then one very important uh, topic uh, is um, increasing, related to the increase of polariton interaction and push it so that we can observe polariton blockade, which means single polariton nonlinearity and the idea that you could actually observe uh, anti-bunching from a single micropillar because you can only inject one polariton at a time. This would allow really the door to a new, uh, to open the door to a completely new field, which is really looking at quantum correlation and entanglement in arrays of lattices, each pillar in arrays of micropillars, each one being in the blockade regime. So there have been uh, two recent papers showing a very small and what they call weak anti anti-bunching. Uh, so the anti-bunching is very small, but it is there. So it allows really to quantify the value of the interaction. And so we know where we are and we know how much we should push the interaction to be in the polariton blockade. So typically the ratio of interaction divided by language should be increased by more than a factor of 10, like maybe 50. So there are several avenues which are proposed uh, to increase interaction. The idea is that you should Couple light to uh, more nonlinear excitation. So there are several proposals, and there is a very active field now uh, looking at that. So you could couple polar uh, light to dipolar excitons, so fabricate what we call dipolar polaritons. So you can do that uh, in uh, inject, uh, having two coupled quantum well inside your cavity and forming the indirect excitons. This is supposed to really enhance very strongly. Uh, interaction. You can also form polaron polariton in cavities where you have uh, an electron gas. Uh, there are reports saying that uh, the trion in 2D materials could also have uh, very strong nonlinearities. And there are also very interesting proposals uh, where you couple photons to fractional quantum whole states. So all these reports really indicate that it's possible to increase the interaction and to uh, to get much stronger photon-photon interactions. So now really we hope to have a bright future in front of us, so to be really able to implement this Bozubert model 
where you have coupled waveguides, uh, coupled micropillars, sorry. On each of them, you have the photon blockade, and then you can look at correlations and really show uh, the creation of uh, multi-photon uh, entangled states, which is really a holy grail of our community now. So I'm going to stop now. I would like uh, to thank all our collaborators, and particular our theoreticians, uh, with whom we have uh, the privilege to work. As you, as you have seen, we are exploring very different kinds of uh, physical phenomena. And this is why we work with uh, quite a lot of uh, different theoretical groups, uh, each of them specialized in a different field. So, uh, for example, for the Kazi crystal, we have been working with the group of Odette Zilberberg. For the flat band, we work with the group of Christian Uchuti. Uh, we also work a lot with uh, Jacopo Carusotto and Tomoki Osawa. Uh, and also uh, Gilles Montambo from the Laboratoire of Photonic uh, Physique des Solides of Corsi. I'm sorry, the name is not there. And the group of Guillaume Malpuech and Stonishkov for everything that is related to topology. Uh, and we also address the question of instability with Michel Bouter. And then, of course, I want to really acknowledge uh, all the experimentalists who have been working uh, in the group. Uh, uh, I want to really acknowledge the people who are fabricating the samples. So, for example, Aristide Lemaitre and Martina, who are growing, the, the, so running the epitaxy to fabricate the cavity. And particularly, Isabel Sang, who is, uh, has developed this etching technique, which is really great. Uh, and then I want to thank my two collaborators, Alberto Amo, who is now in Lille, and Sylvain Ravet, who has joined the group uh, a few years ago. Uh, so who are permanent CNRS members and well, with whom I, I work really with great pleasure and in very strong collaboration. And then I want to thank all the young people who are working with us. You see here a picture which has, was taken a few weeks ago, just after the, the lockdown was finished, we run to the seaside just to, to have some fresh air. And so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have more questions, I'm really happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Okay, okay, thanks for pro, uh, Professor Block again for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, anyone has a uh, last minute question, you may raise your ham, uh, hands up now. And uh, Or if you worry about your audio system, you can type in your uh, question in Q&A, I can read it for you. Um, and uh, if there's no more questions, um, uh, I will uh, thanks uh, for the uh, for Professor Block again, and uh, for the next week, we will have uh, Professor Bian Barnes as speaker uh, of our talk entitled "Linking Molecules with Light." Oh, um, uh, and uh, uh, okay, here is uh, one more questions from corner. Okay, you may. <laughs> okay, should I share screen again? Uh, okay. Hello. Uh Yes. Oh, sorry. Hello. Mm, okay. Yes, sorry. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. So, so you were talking about these phase transitions in quasi crystals, right? So, uh, so, so, um, so, is it like a topological phase transition where you have a topological invariant? Basically, I don't see the topological invariant when you are continuously varying the beta parameter. Uh, you're talking about the, the localization transition that I see here? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, not here, I don't think it is a topological, sorry? Not, not this one, like when you were talking about the criticality when you were uh, varying the beta parameter. From yes, AF to... Yeah, 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 this one, this one, yes. Yeah, so here the, the vertical axis is beta. Yeah, so so is, this, is this a phase transition? Uh, when you are going from it's a topological transition uh, it's a sorry it's a lo delocalization localization transition i think we can call it a, a phase transition i am not sure it is a topological phase transition um i so, don't so if it's, think so it's, so it's like it's so there if it's not a topological phase transition then then there must be some order parameter right? so i don't see that also. But but I, like, I don't uh, think like it, I mean, the other parameter, you could say that it's like this uh, IPR uh, or the, the inverse of the IPR because it goes to, 
it goes to zero here somehow. So you see, there is a, the IPR goes to zero, then goes again. So maybe the IPR could be considered as a as an order parameter, which characterizes the localization. Would you agree with okay. that? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, uh, for the questions. Uh, is there any more questions? Okay, if uh, there's no more questions, um, uh, we will thank Professor Block again. And uh, uh, as I said, the next week will be the Professor Bjorn Boss. Uh, and I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Professor.